Uh, I'll, I'll touch on some preventative measures here in my talk. Um, I'm going to focus a bit more on the response, though. Um, if you do start to see problems, how do you prevent it from getting worse? Um, so we're going to cover um, quite a bit of ground here in the next 20 minutes. Um, I'm also excited to see so many people in the room, and I know that there's, I recognize some people as very experienced producers and some who are relatively new to the industry. So hopefully you all get something out of this talk. One point, um, if you take nothing else away from this, uh, your fish are going to get sick. Um, even with the best preventative measures, uh, you're going to have problems. Um, there's the old adage that you're not a fish farmer until you kill a thousand fish. And my goal is maybe we can bring that number down to a hundred fish instead of a thousand or more. Um, but you are going to have problems. The second thing I want you to be sure to take away from today or the next two days is that fish health has to be considered in all aspects of farm operation. And this isn't just about regulatory inspections or um, vaccines. There, everything that you do has to consider fish health, even your operating budget, your, the way you train your employees, what you feed them, your time management, how you design a system, all should have fish health as a part of that conversation. Um, there's so much to cover here, and you're going to get some great stuff out of the next day and a half. Um, but uh, um, there's a lot more that could be done too. And as you become more familiar and more experienced with your farm operation, you should be touching on all of this and more. There's, um, I think it's important before we dive into the fish health as a, a topic here, just physiology 101, um, stress is critical to the healthier fish. Um, happy fish are healthy fish. So just to give you a sense of what's going on, with your fish and why this is important. Um, like people and other animals, fish have an endocrine system that is designed to adjust to change. It's a good thing in many ways, but it can also result in problems if it goes on too long. So if fish get like, chronic stress, um, perhaps from poor water quality or bad feed, they're gonna start to grow slower, um, immune systems are gonna get suppressed, you have lower feed conversions, um, these are all um, issues, of course. And if you handle them poorly or you're stressing them out by overcrowding, um, other problems can happen. And as these things happen, your fish develop issues. So stress goes up, hormone response goes up, the immunity growth and many other things starts to suffer. Now, even if the system stops here and fish aren't mani manifesting as diseased animals, um, growth and feed conversion, those are impacting your bottom line as producers and should be taken seriously too. Um, but in the end, if left unchecked, stress will make your fish sick and cause them to die. Um, even with things uh, as you know, parasites and commensal bacteria, things that you cannot avoid getting in your system will overtake your fish at some point if they're stressed out. So as Elliot said, and you'll probably hear in some of the other talks, um, healthy fish are happy fish, and you should try to keep it that way. So what can you do about it as producers? And um, the focus here is prevention, and so that's overarching all of this. And I'll touch on that just briefly, and you're going to hear a lot more about that in the next um, few presentations. But I'm going to go into more depth of what happens when things go wrong and how you can prevent it from getting worse. So the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That um, is very true here, probably much more than a pound. Um, healthy fish in, healthy fish out, biosecurity, nutrition, those are really important. And you'll get full talks on that coming up. It's also really important to monitor and control your environmental conditions that are suitable for the species you are raising. And here in the Great Lakes region, there's a lot of species being farmed. And they all require slightly different conditions. And it's important that you understand those and design systems and manage those fish in ways that are most suitable. And again, if you're doing that, it's gonna reduce stress and keep those fish healthy. It's also really, really important that you're doing routine fish health exams. You really have to know your fish. Now this 
might sound obvious, but I've talked to a lot of farmers who um, aren't looking at their fish in ways that might help with this. So it's important that you understand um, growth rates and your feed conversion, what the livers look like in a healthy fish, develop those baseline metrics. So when something starts to go wrong, you can catch it early. And I want to stress that regulatory inspections are not enough. I've heard from farmers who submit their fish for a VHS inspection annually as um, their fish health program, and that's not sufficient. Every other animal production industry has fish health or has health professionals, veterinarians, or trained folks come to their farms or send their animals in to get them checked out. Aquaculture should not be any different um, with that, and I think it's important that you all consider it. But when that doesn't work, and I guarantee you that it's not always going to work to prevent every problem, um, what do you do about it to make it um, not as bad as it could be? The first step in this process um, is to be looking at your fish. And again, maybe an obvious thing, but that can be hard to do um, here in the Great Lakes region. There's a lot of extensive pond production where people put the fish out in a pond and they're not keeping a close eye on them. So it might be long after a, a disease breaks out or the fish die, but they actually realize something happened. And I get that a lot. <laughs> I get a phone calls that a big percent of my fish are just gone when we went to harvest them, or we had this mortality event a month ago and they wanna know what happened. At this point, there's really not a lot that I as a fish health professional can do. It's important that when you're looking at those fish and reaching out to somebody early, I don't think it's, it's also not a coincidence that it seems as though 90% of fish get sick on Friday afternoons. That's when my phone rings, it's a joke in the fish health community. Um, but what's really happening probably, our fish are getting sick on Tuesday and Wednesday and the producer waits until Friday afternoon before the weekend to call somebody about it because they don't want to have go a couple more days without um, the phone being answered. I'll tell you that Diagnostic labs, fish health professionals, we usually work a Monday to Friday job and a Friday afternoon call is probably not gonna get the attention um, that it deserves. So if you can call somebody early when you start to see problems, you're probably gonna get a better response. So who do you call? I highly suggest that you find a local veterinarian or a fish health professional that can help you. Um, you need to maintain and develop and maintain relationships with those people. You will need them eventually. Even if you're just starting out now and you don't have sick fish, find those people. Uh, introduce yourself, build the relationships. When you have a problem, they're on standby. If you're relatively new to aquaculture, you can always try uh, the diagnostic labs in your state. Uh, most states in the Great Lakes region have diagnostic labs at their College of Veterinary Medicines or other places where uh, they're well networked with the veterinarians um, in the area and can probably connect you with somebody. Also talked with other um, experienced producers. If you're seeing a problem, maybe they have seen it too. And I would stress though that you need to trust them, of course, um, they're fellow producers, but you should verify what they're saying, that it makes sense on your farm, that it's legal to do, um, and it's not something different. And I get, um, there's, uh, the internet has all sorts of um, information out there, a lot of it good, a lot of it bad. Um, there's, I see message boards of fish health things, and there's people out there recommending things that would be illegal for food fish, for example, here in this region. And um, if you're just looking there for information, you're probably going to get sent down the wrong path. The next step is to ask the right questions. So you're responding early, that's great. Then you need to ask the right questions. A lot can be answered over the phone. I get a lot of emails with pictures. It's really helpful to figure out what's going on. I would suggest too that you approach each one of these fish health situations with an open mind. Um, it's not likely that, I mean, it's possible that the, the same problem manifests over and over again, um, but it's likely something different each time. Um, and it's also possible that you're doing something wrong, um, stressing those fish out with poor water quality or stocking densities, or um, you should keep an open mind that maybe there's things that you could do to improve 
and that will help the whole process move forward. I'll give you a sense here in the next few slides of some of the questions that I ask producers over the phone that start to narrow down a list of many, many potential problems down to a short list of differentials that um, we can move forward with. So these are just intended as examples um, in why I ask them and how they could be used. So I'm always, often ask somebody how many fish are in the pond and what types of species are there, how many are dead. Um, these start to give um, hints on uh, mortality estimates and depending on different issues, you might expect different mortality rates. Um, stocking densities can be important for measuring oxygen demand um, or disease transmission. The time course for the losses is really important and not something that producers often keep very good track of. It's often relying on memory. So if you have um, data sheets on each tank or pond, um, those are very helpful when starting to diagnose a problem. If you see sudden spikes, it's usually um, a loss of oxygen or a treatment overdose, some sort of something acute. Um, more bell-shaped curves lead me to believe that it's going to be an infectious disease. It ramps up a little bit more slowly and is going to have a tail going down. Um, this is different than the previous figure and might start to narrow down some potential causes. Chronic issues too, if you're seeing one, 2% mortality rates over a longer period of time, um, that's maybe not an infectious disease and maybe something more stress related, water quality or maybe parasite loads are, are low, but a chronic problem or maybe bad feed. Um, so this all helps me start to uh, get a list of things to start working on. Um, did you introduce new fish recently? This might lead me to believe that it's a problem with the fish that were there or the ones that you brought in. And that can help narrow it down as well. And then describing the lesions is critically important. And this can be a challenge over the phone and why I highly um, prefer pictures over email um, or going to the site in person. The two fish on the right-hand side of the slide both have the same primary pathogen, a septic bacterial infection. And the one on top has a secondary fungal infection that um, if you just looked at that one, wouldn't really lead to a final and positive diagnosis. Um, so you have to look at a bunch of stuff and be really descriptive in what you're seeing. Um, and that really, really helps to narrow it down if it's an infectious disease. And just to give you a sense of what that might look like here, um, if someone, calls me up and starts talking about red spots or patches or the body cavity is full of fluid or the scales are starting to pop out, I'm gonna start thinking systemic or septic infections like viruses or bacteria, something in the blood. Uh, and that really narrows down the list of what it could be. And just to give you a sense, if someone called me up, said their fish were pale, there's these hemorrhagic lesions as you can see in this picture, the fish are moving slowly near the surface, um, not feeding well, um, it starts to narrow it down. And I might diagnose um, on a short list of differentials, VHS is the cause of disease. Now, if somebody over the phone starts to describe um, more superficial lesions, so something like ulcers and scale loss, erosions of the skin and fins, um, it's probably going to be something that's on that on the surface of the fish, probably a bacterial infection. But just to give you an example of what this might look like, somebody, if I'm at a farm and I see um, white, grayish lesions on the gills and maybe some frayed fins, I look at it under a microscope and I see little haystack rods. Um, my quick diagnosis will be columnaris. And this can all, of course, be confirmed in the lab, but this will start to narrow down a list and some immediate responses that a producer could do. Parasites, um, some overlap here in the clinical science, but unique aspects to parasites, you might see behavioral changes. The fish will try to um, itch itself on the surface or on um, substrate in the tank or the pond. The seal flashing of the fish, it's, those parasites are irritating them and they're trying to um, get them off essentially. You're gonna see some discoloration perhaps and um, pay close attention to the fins and gills. They'll often eat away at those sensitive edges and um, cause problems. 
So here's an example of what that might look like. Um, sometimes referred to as powdered sugar disease and you can see in this picture, little white dots on the skin, put it underneath the microscope and you see these dark, um, rather large parasites on the gills with a C-shaped nucleus. And you know pretty quickly that that's gonna be ick. Um, so you don't uh, need a lot of fancy diagnostic tools here to start to narrow down the list. Fungal infections are fairly obvious. The fish gets fuzzy. These, this is often a secondary infection though. Um, there are some primary pathogens, uh, fungal pathogens, but um, here we're starting to look at um, secondary issues or chronic stress problems. And there are many non-infectious possibilities as well. Of course, there's genetic and nutritional issues, um, many other things, toxins that can induce disease that aren't related to a pathogen directly that um, should be considered when going through all of your possible issues. One of the biggest ones, um, probably 80% of the fish health problems either originate or are caused by um, poor water quality. Some of this is in your control as producers and some of it's, um, for those of you operating outside, are uh, environmental conditions that are harder to manage, but still something that should be um, thought about. The clinical signs here can be hard to describe. Um, there may not be lesions directly. You might get secondary problems um, because of chronic stress, but water quality should be monitored and considered in all fish health situations. So let's say you've responded early, you've asked the right questions, and it's starting to look bad. Um, those differential lists have uh, led to some pretty serious diseases or um, ones that might project uh, more mortality going forward. So what do you do at that point? Um, in working with your fish health professional um, or a diagnostic lab, you need to start collecting samples. Um, you don't wait until you have huge mortality events to do this. You should do this early in the process and coordinate with the lab to be sure that you're getting the right samples at the right times. Um, poor sample collection gives you poor results. Uh, what you'll probably hear um, will be a need for sick fish, ones that have clinical signs of disease. And that might be obvious um, to most people, but it's uh, often much easier to collect the dead fish, ones that are floating at the surface, um, if they're rotten, they're probably not going to be of very much help. Um, if they're healthy, they're not going to be helpful either, probably. Um, some people will feed the fish to attract them to one side of a pond and then take a sample of those fish. But it's often the sick ones that are off the feed somewhere else in that pond that are really the prime diagnostic samples. So um, spend some time, get good samples to get a good diagnosis. And then the next step is once you have those samples, and this is usually where it gets into a diagnostic lab situation. There are some basic and routine diagnostic tests that you could do on site um, with a microscope and larger farms may have the capacity to do culture-based assays for bacterial um, diseases. But um, choosing the right test is the next step. And there's lots of different things that um, you could do. And depending on the type of disease and this is the value of having that differential list and asking all those right questions, um, it'll really save you time and money if you're starting to focus your efforts. Um, there really isn't a one-size-fits-all diagnostic approach. As you look across these examples of um, fish that I've uh, worked on, if I'm working on a shark, it's very different than a sturgeon and very different than uh, musky fry. So there it could be a lot of different approaches here and asking those questions and getting there early is really gonna narrow down the list um, and get you an answer sooner than later and for a much more affordable cost. Now I include this slide just as reference. This is more of a, um, a diagnostic thing and for fish health professionals, um, we do have a lot of tests at our disposal. Um, we have basic culture-based assays that are really good and commonly used, but um, and fairly affordable, but they lack some specificity and sensitivity that are often needed 
um, for final diagnosis and confirmation. So you usually need a secondary test to know what you're working with. Um, histopathology, looking at the tissue underneath a microscope can be helpful for difficult cases. Uh, molecular tools like PCR, um, those are often targeting very specific pathogens that can be quick, can be fairly affordable, um, but it can be a needle in a haystack too if you don't know what you're looking for. And I think the future of diagnostic testing is really going in the direction of full genome sequencing. Um, the costs are coming way down. The technologies are getting uh, much better and our capacity to do bioinformatics um, is improving every day. So if we give this talk in five, 10 years from now, um, you'll probably see full genome sequencing um, uh, becoming a much more standard practice for fish health diagnoses. Then the last step is to solve the problem. And I don't mean just diagnosing the problem. Um, that's often, it's frustrating for a fish health professional just to provide um, a diagnosis and that's the end of the story. That's not where I think our job ends. Um, and it's not where a farmer should be like satisfied. It's really important that the diagnosis gets incorporated as preventative measures into best management practices. Um, there are things, figure out what that problem was and then figure out how to prevent it in the future. Um, that closes the loop and hopefully saves you time and money going forward and hopefully a lot of dead fish. And you're gonna learn here in the next few uh, presentations um, some of those preventative measures that could be implemented depending on the diagnosis that you receive. Um, so this, I've been going through this very fast. Um, if you're still not sure what to do um, and you have a fish health problem, um, good news. For um, those in the uh, North Central region, um, we just got a project funded in collaboration with Ohio State and Michigan State um, to improve fish health response here um, in this part of the country. And this is going to add capacity and um, expertise in many ways. We'll be hiring a regional aquatic veterinarian who will be based at MSU. Um, announcement of that uh, position will be happening soon. It'll be ramping up quickly. So um, stay tuned on that one if you want to interact with the vet. Um, we're going to be doing farm visits in all more central region states. So apologies to uh, folks from Pennsylvania and um, New York in the room, but uh, the rest of you will benefit from this, I hope. Um, we're going to be collecting samples on those farms to develop vaccine candidates. And we'll also be hosting workshops regionally and inviting people to farms to do fish health, hands-on activities and build capacity at the local level. And we're also going to be providing support with biosecurity planning. Um, which I think will be helpful for everybody and try to address the, the huge diversity of fish production um, and non-fish production that we have here in the Great Lakes region. Um, and then we'll be engaging more closely with local veterinary colleges, um, especially in Michigan, Ohio, and Minnesota um, in hopes to build capacity. Um, there are veterinarians that are out there and uh, many of them are um, interested in aquaculture in the Great Lakes region, but we need more. And we think by developing that capacity with the vet students, um, that'll build uh, um, capacity region-wide going forward. So I covered a lot of ground there, um, and I hopefully have some time for questions 